asleep on this pop filter. <laughs> well, as long as it doesn't attack you, like mine keeps attacking me. You, you ripped okay. yours off last time. <laughs> that was user error. <laughs> oh god. Um before we begin, I do want to make a point of clarification because my husband was listening to uh the episode that aired today uh or for you listeners out there he was listening to the my bloody valentines episode and he was correcting me and said that they never made another friday the 13th movie after that <laughs> and i went yeah they did and he, no no they did not <laughs> and i went oh oh you're right and i'm like i just that whole franchise has more clout though <laughs> like <laughs> obviously didn't they just decide to make the, am i making this up didn't they make like a camp crystal lake mini series or something is that something that like was talked about on the internet or i have that, no idea <laughs> i hold on now i feel like i have to google that because i i'm pretty sure that was a thing that's okay because i think it was two episodes ago that i was telling you about uh the the infected sepsis finger yes yes and i said charlotte and in my head i was picturing cj perry and i meant cj perry and i meant lana but i kept saying charlotte <laughs> oh camp crystal lake ohio that's not correct <laughs> more shit in ohio camp oh crystal lake tv series prequel series to friday the 13th according to imdb follows a doomed small town where camp counselors come to die when is this on is this like a real thing uh well it's got an imdb page so it might not actually exist it might not exist yet oh wait it's coming soon to peacock good to know so that'll get canceled after five episodes yeah i'm not gonna watch it because i don't need a prequel to that i just well that's like the it prequel that max is doing like i don't even understand how it's gonna happen my friend that used to work there was just like just watch it it's fine and i was just like no it's not it's stupid you shouldn't make it and now they don't work there so i don't feel bad saying that <laughs> i just you know as we talked about with my bloody valentine i just feel like with i just feel like there's so many other movies that we could make or books or sh stories that we could make m slasher films out of. And then instead we're like, let's just expand on this franchise even more and like beat it to death. And I'm like, we don't, sometimes we don't need a prequel. Like that's, you know, yeah. with I, like the original Halloween movie, that's what works so well is we get it. Like, Michael Myers could be like a real life dude. We don't need a mythology behind him, and then that's why the it's scary when you don't know, right? And then when you get the the monologuing from the villain and stuff, it's suddenly just silly. Yeah, I just wish that they would stop remaking good movies and like do a second attempt at like shitty movies and make them better, right? That's that's the dream, <laughs> right? Like, hey, do you remember how everybody loved Aragon, the dragon book, and then they made a movie and it completely blew? Why don't you try to fix that? Or why don't you give us a better adaptation of the Spook's Apprentice instead of Seventh Son with the dude? <laughs> <laughs> like, why don't you give us better versions of those? That's true. I there's just Why don't you what was the shitty what was the Thanksgiving twin movie? <laughs> blood rage. Yeah, why don't you make a better blood rage? Oh. In premise I like the idea of blood See? rage. It's really good. Just make it less corny. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Make it actually scary. <laughs> but don't remake Silent Night, Deadly Night. We we just don't need that. It's fine the way it is. Yeah, I mean, didn't they already kind of do that themselves with the second the, one? That's the, just the yeah. same movie. <laughs> they, well, they're like, let's talk about his younger brother, but we don't have much to go off of, so we're just going to show you lots of clips from the first movie. It was like a, 
you know when the simpsons and stuff like that it's like a clip episode yeah, a when clip they're episode. like oh like we're running low on the budget and scheduling's weird so we just did a bottle episode where they're locked in one room so we have one set for the whole week yep, to film on yep. and then this week is just going to be clips from old episodes yep. i love when they, i actually love when they make fun of doing that like i think it's always sunny did that as well uh like a a clip episode but they made fun of it the entire time that's funny yeah um hello <laughs> how are you <laughs> we're fine we're fine here i'm not fine send help uh just you know beth's dealing with uh a low-key sinus infection it's a great time and uh britta is dealing with i'm no longer a human yeah. i don't know what day it is i don't time is a a construct that is lost on me <laughs> And, uh, yeah, we're the Lake Erie Library. We're having a hashtag good time over here. <laughs> Living the dream. I I had so many things. I was like, I'll save that to tell Beth on the podcast. And they were fleeting thoughts that flew out of my brain forever. But the only one I can remember right now, because it happened last night, is that I... I went to the theater to do my show that I'm in, mm -hmm. and I used to always park on the street, but I've been parking in a garage, the same garage that I almost got trapped in forever, <laughs> and like it's been great. I don't want to tell you what it is, because I don't want anybody to take my spot, because I had to go like really far up in the garage Friday night, because there were too many people there. Oh, boy. <laughs> and then... <laughs> I'm going to edit that out so they're not going to know why you're laughing. But then I <laughs> I like pulled in uh last night. So it was a Saturday night and I got there like early. Like I got there at a good time for me to get there for my show. Like I was there before call time and uh I didn't have to I was on the, like the second level level. I was like this is great. Like this is much better than last night. And then um I got in my car after the show and I went I don't have my wallet. <gasps> and I had left it at home. Oh, God. So I had no way to pay to get out of the garage. <laughs> and so <laughs> I just sat there and stared at my steering wheel for 15 minutes like, what do I do? I, like, I don't, I'm, I can't leave. Like, I don't have a way to get out of here. And uh, so I just slowly drove down and I was like, I don't know. I guess we'll find out what happens. <laughs> And the thing was up, so I just drove out. I didn't have oh, to pay. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so I like, I was like, I don't know who's looking out for me, but thank you. <laughs> but it was like, like I don't know, like I think I was maybe in like shock. Like if I left my body, I was like, I don't know my wallet. How am I, how do I pay for this? What do I do? <laughs> do I just stay here? I guess I could sleep in my car. I just live here now. It's okay. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to record the podcast. <laughs> I don't have anyone who can come and get me. And zoom you in. Yeah. From my phone. From your phone. That I also have to read notes off of. <laughs> in, in a parking garage where I don't get good reception. It's going to be great. I would have rescued you. Yeah, but like I, I still don't know how. Like you would have had to come get me. I would have had and to then park. drive and yeah. then drive me home to get my wallet and then drive I would have me just back. You money, it's but it's not cash. It's card only. I would have just paid for it. I would have parked outside and then. There's nowhere to park outside. Oh well, I would have figured. You just it would out. have had to throw on your flashers. Yeah, and then the popo would have got you because they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Yeah. I mean, I already told you my fun story, which is I've now reached peak uh, tater tot mom where I was sitting in the back seat of the car with my tater tot and he handed me a pile of toys and then he had in his hand what I thought was like a piece of lint and um, all I heard was, what's this? And I was like, I don't know, let me see. And then I... Uh, was handed what I thought was going to be a piece of lint, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh, it's a dead bug! And then I threw it. <laughs> My husband's like, what is happening? I was like, I, 
Tater, Tom hit him. He had dead bug. He was dead. It wasn't going to do anything. I just, still, that's not what you expect to be handed. They don't even have, like, oozy insides. They, it no, was just it like was a so dried dry up husk, husk at that point. Yeah. So that was a. I would have kept it. Peak, as I said, peak I mom moment. I would have treasured that. I would have <laughs> been like, thank you for this wonderful gift. I'm just thinking of the little tater tot patron we had. Who came in <laughs> the on, aunt. Yeah, who came in on their birthday <laughs> with like a little bug catching kit and uh, <laughs> they shook it really hard. And they're like, oh, I got a bug. Oh, it's dead. <laughs> and then he put it back in the bug observation thing yeah. and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I'm so sad because they're not a tater tot anymore. He's like a real person now. Yeah. God. Time is marching forward. Um, so yeah, uh we're just having a good old time here. I guess let's try to I guess segue into what we want to discuss today. Um how are you feeling about crime right now? Always down for it. Let's go do it. Okay. <laughs> This is considered one of the crimes of the century, I think, as far as I'm as what I've read. So this is like a stupid bread of brain thing. Um, but the the person we're gonna talk about, there is also um an award winning playwright and actor with the same name. I know, because I tried Googling it and I was <laughs> like, This this isn't right. Yeah. Why no how well, do I fix this? So this has always been a, a thing for me because like I was a I went to theater school and so I would try to talk about this person, the person from Ohio, and everyone in my classes would be like, Oh my god, I love buried child. And I was like, Wow, I hate that play. Why are you talking about that? <laughs> Cause they thought I was and I'm like, No, I don't like that guy. I mean, good on him. Plenty of theater awards. Uh, a lot of people really like his plays. I hate them. So, and I think he played Ryan Gosling's dad in The Notebook. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. So, for those of you who are not uh, picking up what we're throwing down. We haven't really dropped anything. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are discussing today... The murder of Marilyn Shepard and the trial of Sam Shepard. Dr. Sam Shepard. Doctor. Put the respect on, on that name. Well, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is considered the crime of the century because, one, even though Sam Shepard was tried and found guilty, he was then later retried and found not guilty and I don't know about you, but when I was researching this, I found equal sources of people being like, oh, no, he for sure did it. And other sources are like, he's innocent. Most of what I watched and read was in the second camp. Mm -hmm. um, but that was because I was watching a lot of actual like forensics and like true right. CSI stuff. Right. That's the whole story. We just told you everything you need to know. Yep. So if you're like, man, Beth and Britta, I don't really feel like listening to an hour of you guys talking today. Well, <laughs> there you go. You can turn it off after 13 minutes. There you go. All wrapped up. But stay spooky. Yeah. Doom. Doom, 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 doom. Uh, but this is it's like this is a very interesting trial and there's a lot that you have to question when you're reading like what happened and stuff like that and it's just we will take like a deep dive into this and to kind of you know who Sam Shepard was um, talking about kind of his marriage and whatnot and like the events that led up to this as well as um, just the the media circus surrounding the trial and you know his his court case um actually reverberated nationally like this was a well kind of followed and documented um crime but in trial but it also became a supreme court trial that uh had like bigger implications and whatnot yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about his life after the trial, and we will talk about also um, kind of further further things that have been done to try to clear his name. I think that covers like a basic 
that's the intro of everything before we dive right in. So yeah, we're gonna talk about that and I guess give you some of the nitty gritty detail and who theoretically did murder Marilyn. I've read a few things about that as well. We do not have spoiler alert we do not have uh actual concrete they do have dna evidence but they do not have concrete evidence of exactly who mur- did this murder so there will never be any kind of like justice taken from that unfortunately which means sam shepherd's name will never be fully 100 percent cleared i don't you have anything else you want to add to that intro no i'm it? ready to dive in all right all right let's uh let's talk about Sam Shepard. Oh, also, we'll talk about, I said his later career, but there's also, like, a wrestling connection, which you guys don't know this, because we haven't, like, talked about it, but we're, well, sort of we've talked about it with Britta's, like, weird, uh, (laughs) being afraid of my husband's, uh, action figure collection, but, um, we're big wrestling fans, so we'll talk about this wrestling connection, uh, that Sam Shepard has. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, We are going back to 1954. On July 3rd, Dr. Sam Shepard is in his early 30s. He's finishing up his neurosurgery residence, I believe. I don't know if he is, like, fully, like, practicing neurosurgeon at that time because that's pretty unheard of at that age. But he's, like, a pretty well-known doctor. And uh, his wife, Marilyn, were um, having dinner with their friends. They uh, had some friends in their neighborhood, Don and Nancy Ahern, and their two children joined the Shepherd family. They also had Sam Jr., who was eight at this time. And they had drinks and dinner, and they, um, you know, as you do, like, at a dinner party in the 1950s, like, you kind of, like, you know, just spend the whole evening. It's like an event. Um, one thing I, I love, read. They said it's a casual dinner, but they spent pretty much all night together. Right. One thing <clears> that <throat> I read said that they sat on like the screen porch and like watched the sunset and like you know they probably had like coffee. I feel like that's a very like after dinner thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I watched a true CSI episode where they interviewed Sam's brother Stephen, and he was like giving the details of what happened, and they were saying. That, like, after dinner, they went into, like, the living room to watch a movie on Mm -hmm. TV. And then, like, Sam fell asleep on the couch and their friends left. Yes, that's what I've read as well. After they finished dinner, Don Ahern, this is the friend, took his two kids back home, put them to bed, drove back to the Shepherds. Marilyn, like... No one was at home with those two kids sleeping. Right. I don't like the, that. It was the 50s. I know. I still don't like it. It was the 50s in Bay Village, Ohio. They like probably didn't even lock their doors. Right. <laughs> we should set the scene. So the shepherds lived in this beautiful house on the lake. Like their backyard was, I believe, on the lake. Yes. There was like a pathway down to the sand in their backyard. And, you know, Bay Village at the time, very kind of sleepy, bedroom-esque, like, like nice place to live. He worked at the Bay Village Hospital, which I was like, oh, first of all, I didn't know Bay Village had a hospital. But then I was reading it and his dad owned the hospital. And I went, oh, have you seen pictures of it, too? It just looks like a house. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it was just nepotism. I get it. (laughs) I mean, he was a doctor. He was a doctor. He went to med school. He went to med school. He practiced osteopathic medicine. So... Like, yeah, he was, and then he was also doing neurosurgery. So he was, he was not like, not to knock his education. It's just, I laughed when I realized that his dad owned the hospital. Cause I was like, oh, and then your brother works there. So it's just like a big family affair. That's like how it was then though, is you yeah. had like a family practice where your whole family went into the same like job. Cause it was expected for the kids to take it over. Right. Like, everything, like, grocery stores, hospitals, funeral homes, like, like that's just how it was. Right. I, we talked about the recent deep dive I did, right? Uh, I... On what? Nepo baby? Yeah, on Nepo baby. On the, the couple of family oh, tree. Yeah. 
I just didn't yeah. realize how far it extended. And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you kidding me? All of them are in Hollywood? Well, they're like, the, they're like the Houstons. Like the Houstons, that whole family's in film too. I just didn't realize how far the tree extended. Yeah. So anyway. As I wear my Nicolas Cage forever shirt. Jesus. <laughs> Did you buy that from like a kiosk in a mall? It looks like I did, <laughs> but no, I bought it from, shout out to Toy Snobs, I bought it from Toy Snobs. I Amazing. saw the shirt and I was like, I have to have it. It's, <laughs> I have to have it. It's glorious. Amazing. All right. So they finish dinner. They're hanging out. They're, you know, whatever, yucking it up as you do. I don't know what they talked about in the 1950s. Probably like something they read in the newspaper. How are you keeping your grass so green and trimmed? I don't know. But it, it was said, though, they said that, that Marilyn and Sam were having like a very good time. She was sitting on his lap, canoodling with him. Um, well, according to Sam, that's yes. the only person who said that. <laughs> And they watched a movie. Um, Sam, they had like a daybed couch in like an adjacent living room. Um, he went and fell asleep on the couch. And then the Aherns left and Marilyn went to bed. At roughly 540 the next morning, the police were called to their home. And uh, the mayor of Bay Village was also phoned by his friend Sam Shepard <laughs> who just said you need to get over here and he also said I think they killed Marilyn so the police go over there the mayor goes over there what they find is not good <laughs> <laughs> no not at all um according to Sam what had happened was he had been sleeping on the couch he heard a scream that woke him up. He runs upstairs to the bedroom where he sees a man with bushy hair. He doesn't describe this man very well. That's it. All he says is bushy hair. And at one point he calls them a white clad biped, which I'm like, Sam, what what are we doing here? If you have you read like any of the transcripts of stuff he said that like that's how he spoke. It was very like I am a doctor. I use specific terminology. Yeah, I, so, we're, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but just the mannerisms of him and from like what I've read and just the phrases I've read, I'm like, hmm, accused of murdering your wife, going to jail, might be wrongfully accused, don't have any direct evidence. You don't escape prison through a shitter. <laughs> But feels very Shawshanky to me. <laughs> I'm not saying Stephen King was like directly affected by this, but I think this did make national news, and he would have been like a kid while this was making national news. So maybe a I little think inkling, more but... more likely, or maybe and, he watched now, The Fugitive. I was just gonna say, and now like our timeline is all out of order, and I'm gonna have to edit the shit out of this episode. Yeah. But I think more likely he probably watched the TV show, right? But anyway, Sam says that he fell asleep on the sofa. He heard a scream at like four something in the morning. Right. Probably about 4.30 ish, I think I read. And he runs upstairs to the bedroom where he sees the shape of a person. It is dark. It's the middle of the night slash morning. They had all been asleep. Um, he sees this man with bushy hair who he says he struggles with. Mm hmm. The man runs from the house. Well, he gets hit on the head. Yes. The man runs from the house. Sam is unconscious on the ground. He wakes up, chases after the man checks, down to the beach. He checks on his wife first, takes her pulse, and goes, I think she might be dead. <laughs> then he checks on his son. Son's asleep, like, through the whole thing. Then he goes off to the beach to check for the man. The man's still there. I, that's the timeline that I don't understand. Like, the man knocks him out again. Yes. <laughs> he wakes up on the beach. He goes back home. He checks on Marilyn again. She's still dead. She's very dead. He calls the mayor and then he calls the police. In this time, the family dog has not woken up once, nor has Sam Jr., which is very odd. <laughs> when the police get there, 
Sam has a blood stain on his pants. He is not wearing a shirt. He has no other blood on him. And Marilyn is laying on the bed. Her like night clothes were pushed up. The bed clothes were pulled down. She has been bludgeoned to death. Her her face was not recognizable. Yes. Um, there is blood spatter all over the walls. The bed is stained with blood. It is very horrific, the scene that they find. I, I will say that he does, from what I've read, uh, they, so Esther, who's the wife of the mayor that he calls, um, she, they they look around to see if there was like a sign of, because if there was another guy, they look around to see if there was like a sign of like, a burglary um and shepherd's desk drawers were removed the contents of his medical bag were strewn across the floor after the mayor did arrive they also called they called one of uh sam's brothers richard who was also a doctor and he examined marilyn's body to see if anything could be done to save her but he was like she no she just she's gone then the police, the coroner, and uh, Shepard's other brother, Steve, then arrived at the scene. So the two brothers, which I guess, you know, if you're the police, I I don't, this is this is the part where I'm like very confused because I was like, it was the 50s, it was a different time, but I was like, I just feel like if this were, if this sort of crime were to happen today, I don't think like the two brothers would have been allowed on the scene. Oh, absolutely not. They did not secure this crime scene at all. No. Like, that was the next thing I was going to say is like literally one of the Cleveland Browns football players was good friends with the Shepherds. Right. Like his wife was really close with Marilyn and he was just like, oh, what's going on over at the Shepherd place? And was like on his way like to or from like Brown's training camp. Right. And so he just like walks in the house right. and he walks in the room. He's like, oh, it looks like somebody took a bunch of red paint and like flung it on the wall. Right. Like, but how? Like, what? Because they didn't have DNA I know they evidence didn't have back DNA, then, Beth. Even, so they didn't think about but it. But even then, like, when you want to secure crime, like, if you are being told by this husband, like, someone killed my wife, there's nothing to secure. You took but, the body away. You have him for questioning. That's all your evidence. I it just you wouldn't want to like check and see if there was any signs of a struggle or like I know they didn't have DNA, but they had like they had to have been analyzing blood and stuff like that, right? Like blood splatter. They really weren't though. So I, I just question. I have questions. There yeah. was like one guy who was doing that, and he wasn't right from he wasn't around there. here. Um. That was like before blood spatter analysis was a thing. Like the literally the forefather of it is the one who steps into this case later. But yeah, his two brothers come and they examine him and he so he does have injuries, um, but they're not really other than like so he got hit in the back of the head, right? And he like on the back of his neck. Um he has other injuries. This was questioned, uh one article I read said that Marilyn, Marilyn had multiple lacerations across most of her. She had like thirty five cuts, and they were mostly on her face. Like she was bludgeoned to death. Yeah, she had tw twenty curved gashes in her face and scalp. And then one article I read, but I think they're getting sources from different things said that her teeth were bashed in. Yes. Like she had bitten something. Her teeth were damaged. Um. And then somebody said that his teeth were bashed in, like Sam's teeth were. But I, I'm like, I they can't both be bashed in, right? That would be weird. I don't know. Conflicting. I did not hear that about his teeth. So that was in one of the articles I, just, I read. But the injuries I heard were like he had like obvious injuries to his head where he'd been struck, mm -hmm. and that his neck was broken. Right, and then I. I read that his lower back, like his C3, C4, were damaged. Like, as if somebody, like, threw him to the ground or, like, struck him in the back. Which, I I guess, like, if eventually you're chasing down an assailant and you're in the sand of Lake Erie, yeah, uh, that's possible. So, like we were saying, this is, this is before, like, forensic DNA is a thing. Um, 
basically the people who came to inspect the crime scene were just like, hmm, horrifically murdered dead wife, husband that says he doesn't remember anything, no broken windows, no forced entry. Oh, yep, open and shut case. We know who did it. All right, yep. let's get out of here. So they didn't really like they didn't. do anything. They took they woke Sam Jr. up. The interview that I watched, he said he like remembers this vividly because he was sound asleep. And he's like, I woke up and there were two strange men in my room and they picked me up and they like carried me in a way that I couldn't see into my parents' bedroom and they took me out of the house. And I like he asked like where his parents were and they just like took him away from the house. (laughs) That's so sad. So, I mean, at least he didn't see that in that moment. I'm sure, unfortunately, he's probably seen like the photos since then. But yes. and I will also say is like a trigger warning. Um, so Marilyn was, they think she, they don't know if she was, f- they never said if she was fully sexually, but her clothes were roughed up. Like they, she may have been assaulted, um, but she was four months pregnant with a little boy at the time. So she lost her life and the baby's life as well. Mm-hmm. So, after wrapping up the open shut case at the house, um, the detective who was there to inspect it went over to the hospital to interview the doctor, Sam Shepard. And he really only talked to him for like 10 minutes. He took his clothes, which was pretty much just like underwear, pants, belt, and shoes, because remember, he wasn't wearing a shirt. Um, he noted that there was that blood stain on the one leg of his pants. And he said at the time he thought he, it looked like he probably knelt in blood and that's how it got on him. And, um, at this point, like I just said, like everyone at the crime scene is like, it's pretty obvious he did it. And so, um, he, he sends two of his like rookie detectives back to the hospital to fully interview Sam, who basically tells the story we just told about waking up with a scream, the bushy haired man, getting knocked out like twice, waking up on the beach, whatever. And then he's like, I don't remember anything else. Like he just kept saying, I don't remember. I don't remember. Right. They and kept, they, asked, they thought they thought if they could like go there that he would like change his story and they could kind of wiggle out a confession. But like Yeah. And so they they even asked him, they're like, well, why did you call, like, the mayor before you called the cops? And he's like, honestly, it was the only phone number I could think of when I woke up. Like, I couldn't remember anybody else's phone number. This was before the days of cell phones. Could you just imagine, like, yeah. if something traumatic happened and you're just like, oh, God, what number can I, re-? like, I, so I have my husband's number memorized, but it's like, like, can you imagine being in that type of situation and, like, you're like, I'm going to call the first number I can think of. Yeah. And then um, they they sort of start pressing him about this and they're trying to like kind of good cop, bad cop. And he's like, well, I don't know about, you know, Bill, my partner. I don't know what their names are. And he's like, I don't know about Bill over here, but I'm pretty sure you killed your wife. And he's like, no, like I loved my wife. He's like, oh, well, was she cheating on you? And he was sort of flabbergasted by that. And they're like, well, were you cheating on her? And he sort of abruptly was like no Mm. I just told you I loved my wife and so they didn't really get anywhere with that but he um had his a a lawyer come to visit him while he was there right he had a criminal defense lawyer come visit him which is not not a good sign and um this as Beth said pretty quickly blew up it was all over Cleveland newspapers. Um, The morning after Marilyn's murder, there was a picture of her in the Cleveland press with like, it was like front page news, center headline, like bold font, doctor's wife murdered in Bay Village. Um, And then they also ran a picture of Sam in the hospital with like the neck brace. And he's like, you know, we are like laying in bed and like old timey movies and they're in traction and like limbs are like up in the air and stuff. Um, and at that time, they, in that story, theorized that drug thieves were suspected in the bludgeoning. 
which I mean, I don't know how doctors worked in the 1950s, but like I can't imagine that they just had like copious amounts of like what like uh, opium or uh, something in their house like uh, i don't know what they were mommy's, using back then helpers, yeah uppers right? and downers yeah. i don't know i figured those probably stay at the hospital but very quickly the media plays into that same old story of like the husband did it and it got pretty hostile the stories they were running towards him the editor of the cleveland press at that time louis b seltzer was like really really harsh on him on July 8th, so this is like four days after her body was discovered. Right, four days. And we don't have DNA, we don't have anything, like we don't do that. He ran a story that was a- accusing the Shepherd family of trying to interfere with the investigation. And he quoted um, a prosecutor and he said, in my 23 years of criminal prosecution, I have never seen such flagrant stalling as in this case by the family of Dr. Samuel Shepherd." And uh, they followed that up with saying that Sam declined to take a lie, de- lie detector test. And they said that for whatever reason, the investigative authorities were slow in getting started, fumbling when they did, awkward in breaking through the protective barriers of the family, and far less aggressive than they should have been in the following out clues, tracks, and evidence. By the end of the month, they were just running front page stories saying, why no inquest? Do it now. I just, like, I I guess I, you know, I think about, this is my ignorance probably as a modern person, but I just think about now how in media we have, like, clickbait and stuff like that, and I'm like, and everyone talks about, like, the prestige of journalism back in the day, and then I read stuff like this, and I'm like, oh, no, we've always had kind of shitty journalism that, like plays up to stuff and this of course was gonna sell like you know you have this like beautiful couple the wife was slain the husband looks very suspicious the police can't find any direct evidence to make it not seem suspicious they already have an idea that he did it so you have the coroner like not even doing half-assing their job like yeah they're like yeah they did it he he did it. He's obviously guilty. So, and then you have, and it's like a big prominent family. Like, you know, they were like a very prominent family in Bay Village. So you have like kind of that local Cleveland connection as well of like, oh, this is, this is good. Like popcorn, like, or I don't know, morning coffee or office. T- they didn't have water coolers back then, right? What did they, they stand around the coffee? And- they probably had water coolers. Yeah. Talk, talk about it like did you hear about sam shepherd he murdered his wife they haven't like suspect or they haven't got him yet i mean it's like what when we were talking about velma west I right mean, you know it's that same it's the media has always swayed the court of public opinion right so they in their search for possible motive like they they have presented multiple theories and i wish i had my other notes because i had them written out so nicely so they did an autopsy on Marilyn. There were signs the damage to her hands and fingers showed that she struggled. As Beth said, her, her teeth were damaged. She had multiple curved like gashes in her head from like whatever she had been bludgeoned with. Initially, they determined it was some sort of medical tool. They would later change on that, but... That also might have just been because they're like, well, the doctor did it. He probably beat her to death with his, I don't know, stethoscope. I don't know. Whatever. Something heavier than that. But that's the only medical thing I can think of he would have in his house. What are are those? They were like shaped like a triangle. They touch your, your, like 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 a a hammer. hammer. Yeah. I don't think that's the name of it, though. No. I don't know. Don't come for us like any medical professional people. Unless like you nicely like, hey, just letting you know it's this. Right. They did find that she was four months pregnant. And so I read that they did like test the the fetus and it was Sam's Mm -hmm. baby. So like the initial thoughts of like, oh, well, she had an affair and she got pregnant and he murdered her in a fit of rage like that. That was very quickly, like, that theory was put to rest. But in the discussions around 
her autopsy findings and um, these initial theories, it was sort of going around that a neighbor had told, and again, they tested the baby, so this is not true, but a neighbor said that Marilyn had told her that Sam was sterile from spending too much time near x-ray machines. And so that was what led to the police being like, aha, got it. This is making more sense. She had an affair. She got knocked up. He was pissed about it. Then the story flips and they're like, well, wait, maybe he was having an affair and she found out. And so that became the sort of favored theory of why like this good looking, successful guy who, as his brother said, literally nothing has ever like nothing bad had ever happened to him in his life up until that point. Like, he called him, like, a prince. Like, Mm. he's just lived this, like, beautiful, privileged life with no problems ever. Why a man like that would want to kill not only his beautiful wife, but his beautiful pregnant wife. Right. Who was the mother of his son, and he was, like, really, like, a family man. Like, he loved his family. He loved his son. And was, like, openly, like, he would brag all the time about, like, yeah, well, I got the first grandson in the family. Like, my son is the first grandson. Aww. So they're, they they turn to why why might he have done this? Well, was he seeing somebody else on the side? Mm. Which then turns out to be true. He was having an affair with a nurse from the hospital who would then testify in court about it so i like it also makes sense that he's working long hours at the i'm listen i'm not condoning cheating um (laughs) but he's working long hours at the hospital she's not an ugly woman and you know i don't know workplace sparks fly and yeah i he it wasn't that he didn't love his wife but he decided that he wanted to give in to his baser male instinct. I'm not condoning this. It's a scumbag thing to do. It would have been better. This would is, been listen, better. yesterday, I, this is going to take, we've made it very far without a segue. So here's a <laughs> tangent that I'm going to go off on. Yesterday, Buddy the Elf co-worker was sitting uh, in the workroom and um, student Shelver was reading the Iliad on their break <laughs> and came out and was like, why are there never any good men in these stories? And I said, because men. And Buddy the Elf co-worker said, oh, no, there's some good ones, and started naming people, and I was just, like, shutting it down left and right. <laughs> and then she's like, well, not all men are bad. Like, this guy from this Jane Austen book is good. Aragorn is good. And I was just like, boo! Boo! <laughs> Until she stopped. It's like, you're not going to win this. We're not going to... Right now, you are not going to win this argument with me. 99.9% of the time, if there's a problem, men. Uh, Their fault. It is funny because I also was talking to student Shelver, and they were talking about, they're like, have you read the Odyssey? And I was like, ugh, yes. And (laughs) they're like, did you know there's a music? It's so good. And I was like, that's cool. I said, except I just have a problem with the Odyssey. I said, because Odysseus is just the biggest fuck boy. And they're like, Yes, and then I realized I said "fuck boy" <laughs> out loud, and I went, "Uh, oop. I'm like, you know what though? It's not inaccurate. No, I feel that way, and I'm like, I get really irritated. Oh, I miss my wife. I spent ten years on an island having sex with all the sirens, but I miss my wife. I'm like, get out of here. Oh, I'm gonna go fight all the suitors she has. I'm like, you've been gone twenty years. Go get get out of here. Ugh get so angry about that like get oh men men <laughs> anyway <laughs> so uh in questioning that july around july 10th uh sam was being questioned at the sheriff's headquarters and they brought up a lab technician named susan hayes and they asked him if he had ever had an affair with sue hayes and sam said nope we're just good friends and It came out later that, you know, they met in the early 50s. She had done some lab work for his emergency calls. And uh, their relationship became more than just friends. And they apparently had some encounters in his car and in her apartment. 
And at this time, Susan Hayes was actually living in California. And when they spoke to her and she confirmed that the relationship was, in fact, an affair and they had had a sexual relationship, this just really cemented Sam's public image as, like, a liar, a philanderer, (sighs) an adulterer. Of course he would murder his wife. Like, if he'll cheat on her, why wouldn't he murder her? Which I'm not... I'm not saying that, like, I'm rooting for him or anything like that, but I'm just saying, like, Sam, you made a lot of not smart decisions, but had Marilyn lived, would it have mattered if you che- I mean, you still are doing a scumbag thing by cheating, but, yeah, like, would the public have even cared? Probably not, you know? Yeah. On July 22nd, they actually began an inquest in the Bay Village School Gymnasium. I, When I read this, I was so, like, icked by that. Packed full of people. Sam's there in his little neck brace, and he's answering questions. <laughs> there are pictures of him being questioned at this in the gymnasium at, like, folding card tables. And they had him tell his story again. They said and I quote, that he was unnaturally detached and cool, which we've talked about before. And I will say that, like, yes, sometimes you can just get an accurate read on somebody like that because they did do it. But everybody also processes things differently. And just because you seem like you're not that upset while, like, answering questions about a murdered loved one does not mean that you murdered your loved one. (laughs) Not to get too silly on this but he was born on december 29th 1923 which means he's a capricorn Capricorn. (laughs) he's just compartmentalizing i think he also as i said before like he was a medical doctor and like that was a big part of his life and so i think he had a very like educated higher register vocabulary because they would ask him questions like well, did you run after the guy to the beach or did you walk? And his response was, I can't give you a specific recollection. I proceeded as rapidly as I could. I'm not laughing. I'm just like. Like his. Yeah. The way he. he, He's like a scientific mindset. He doesn't use like idiomatic speech. Right. So because essentially, as we said, like the public is judging you just as much as like these officials are. Because you are not presenting yourself in a favorable favorable light because you are not emoting the right and which we've talked about before, um, when we were talking about like other true crime stuff. It's like when you don't present the right emotions, people automatically get suspicious, which is not the good. thing that I always think of when this comes up is Amanda Knox and how everyone like vilified her. When her roommate was murdered, I don't. If you don't remember this, Amanda Knox was she was a um, a foreign exchange student, like in college, like she was studying abroad in Italy. Her roommate was brutally murdered, and then she, as an American, became the prime sub- suspect and was detained in Italian prison for years. And they essentially like saw her standing outside the apartment with her boyfriend at the time. She's like in her early twenties. And she's, like, kissing her boyfriend and, like, like you know, like, having, like, little side conversations with him. And because she was, like, laughing with her boyfriend about whatever they were talking about and because she was, like, kissing him and didn't seem, like, completely devastated that her roommate had been murdered, they were like, oh, she clearly did it. Look at her. She's a psychopath. God. And I'm like, or she was, like, a 20-something idiot girl who right. was, like love bomb crazy about this guy like you're stupid at that age and also like it's not like they were best friends like she only knew this girl for a short amount of time together and like yeah that's a horrific thing to go through and she might have also been in shock a little bit right like you don't get to determine how somebody processes grief like just because she is able to stand there and not be like on the ground ripping her hair out over a girl she's known for like a month or so does not mean that she killed that person but that's what i always think of when this comes up i was like oh well they were just like very devoid of emotion and i'm like yeah well that's people in shock are like that right Right. Like, you don't know. You don't know what was going on. And I'm not trying to defend a man, but I just defended a man. <laughs> so, they his 
his lawyer kept telling him essentially like any questions about Susan Hayes, just deny it because we can probably get it ruled as like irrelevant and it won't be admissible in your case. So every time they'd ask him, he would be like, yeah, absolutely not. Never slept with her. And they're like, well, what about this one time when the, you guys stayed four nights at like a house in Southern California together? Yeah. So it, the gym like went nuts. And <laughs> right, so right. Did it, it's at the mostly female it, crowd. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, I can't tell either. I'm like, is it a female crowd? Because one, they're like, oh, good looking man. Or is it female crowd? Because like they are rooting for justice for Marilyn or both. Or is it female crowd because it's the fifties and they don't have day jobs and they can go down to the gym. All are possible, <laughs> right? Porque no las tres. <laughs> um, so yeah, at this point, like they're frothing at the mouth for a trial. They've, Pretty much all of Bay Village is like, he did it. He killed her. Like, let's let's get him sent to jail. Let's take him in. He was eventually arrested. The Cleveland Press also wrote a lovely uh, headline again of quit stalling. Bring him in. Yeah. So he was arrested from his parents' home. At this point, his house had been sealed off. So, like, nobody was going in the house anymore. It had not been cleaned up, but nobody was going in the house. He was staying with his parents. He was arrested. Um, he was interrogated for like 22 hours over the next two days and his story has not changed. The things he said have been pretty much the same and anything else they ask him, he said, I don't remember. In August, they started to, um, get a jury together and they started considering evidence against him. So the mayor stepped in at that time and said that at one point Marilyn had called Sam a Jekyll and Hyde. Which I just like I'm sure I'm look I don't know I'm not uh, there but I am married so I can attest to like you know not every relationship's a hundred percent but that doesn't mean that your husband murdered yes in a lot of cases the husband usually did it however does that happen in every single case no and I just feel like you cannot, I, I don't know how, like, you would literally have to be, like, up somebody's ass every day, like, BFFFs, five ever, basically living with them to talk about somebody's marriage. Because you don't see everything behind closed doors. Well, especially not in the 50s. No. Because you, I mean, all kinds of things were, like, that was just not something you talked about outside no. of your house. And so. so I just, like, what if that was just, like... She was having a bad day with Sam. I also wonder how much of these, like, hearsay things are just, like, somebody being, like, caught up and they're like, oh, like, yeah, like, I'm a part of it. I'm connected <laughs> to it. Well, the one time she told me that he just was Jekyll and Hyde and he uh, he smashed a dinner plate. Yeah, a dinner plate. Like, <laughs> that is, happens but, as like, well. If he is so, like, Dr. Dr. Jekyll is very refined and stoic and stuff. What if his Mr. Hyde aspect was like he was wild and bad or something? We don't know. We don't know. Like, what if that was a different reference? Granted, in the book, like, Hyde kills people. He stomps on them to death. And so this is not painting well in my favor <laughs> in my argument. Yeah, but... I, mean, I, I get what you're saying, though, because that's, I mean, you just use that as a a a phrase to describe somebody who has like very differing personalities and i can see somebody saying that in terms of like oh well like yeah you know like when we have like vacation and he's home and it's the three of us he's like very sweet and he's a doting dad and it's great and we love each other mm -hmm. but then like when he's working long hours and he's overly tired and he comes home he's really short-tempered and like things that wouldn't normally piss him off piss him off and he snaps at me like i could very easily see that being right. the course of that conversation and that's a totally normal thing like, right right and being taken completely out of context right uh they flew says susan hayes in from california to question her she called him dr sam i don't know why i made her sound like that but i did listen she's a babe i've seen pictures anyway i get it sam so they <laughs> They um, told the jury that they are, were considering this premeditated because of, you know, 
the philandering was was a motivation um there was also some evidence that sam wanted a divorce i believe susan actually says that at some point where like divorce was brought up between the two of them during their affair and that he he didn't necessarily specifically say he wanted a divorce but he said something along the lines of like i i love my wife i love marilyn but i i don't love her as my wife anymore or something along those lines where it's like i care deeply about her but i don't necessarily want to be in this marriage anymore i read that one of the reasons he had the affair and this is jumping ahead is because like after she had her first baby she was like not into having sex and i'm like okay that's fair it was the 50s like you're not getting the support you probably need um raising a kid and then but i'm also like she was pregnant with your second and you probably knew about it because she was halfway along almost so what yeah what there's things that don't add up right now yeah and that's one big part of it right so august 17th well august 16th sam was released from jail on a fifty thousand dollar bail which i don't know how what fifty thousand dollars in 1950 equates to today but yowzers that's gonna do the math here so the day after he was released on bail the grand jury decided to indict him on a first degree murder charge and he was rearrested. So he got out for a day and then probably went right back. Sorry, I'm still looking. It That's up. okay. Uh, are you ready? <laughs> it's over half a million dollars. $559,182.16 in 2024. Yeah, that sounds about right so much money yeah good god i feel like that was probably all of their money right um okay so 1954 october 18th sam's trial starts in the cleveland courtroom of 70 year old judge edward blythen he is going to become important later on this was like the first court case that sort of set the precedent for like the media frenzy we associate with like huge trials like this right. now like reporters from across the country came to the cleveland courthouse which if you have never been to cleveland it is like right downtown it's right. this huge building there were people packing the streets there were mm -hmm. people sort of slightly scaling the building to look in windows <laughs> because they wanted to get a glimpse of what was happening in this courtroom like people were bonkers i hope it was nice out it's, it's october in ohio it like, could go either way you know what i mean it could just be so nasty out and you're standing out there like let me see him let me see the man murdering like wife killer like, yeah. get out of here yeah go home so one of the people in the jury was dorothy kilgallen who actually she was a she's a syndicated columnist but she was also on a television show called what's my line it was like a game show um she was one of the jurors selected for this trial and she had written in like a report at, at early in the trial she said the fact that at this stage it's equally impossible it's equally possible for the rational mind to find him innocent or guilty is what may make the shepherd trial a celebrated cause to rank with the classic puzzle of lizzie borden so I she's basically to, equating the like i mean it could go either way how about to, to equate that to lizzie borden well she bludgeoned the shit out of her family in I, the same way yeah, I, allegedly she allegedly bludgeoned the shit out of her family i used to be like hard into like yeah she did it but like i have kind of changed my mind on that in the last few years but you know what i'm saying though like that was already like when she didn't when she was innocent people were like oh okay yeah so i i'm just dorothy well come on you're making a big kind of assumption here mm -hmm. so she I misspoke. She was not part of the jury. She was there covering jury selection. So she wrote that about it. And then she, because she was like a big known person, she's on TV, the judge was like, oh, hey, let's have a little chat. And so Judge Blythen had her come into his office, his judge's chambers, during a break in the jury selection. And he said, oh, this is, this is an open and shut case. And she was like, what do you mean? And he's like, 
Oh, everyone knows he's guilty as hell. That is a direct quote. He's guilty, guilty as, as hell. hell. So his trial has not even officially started. They're still nope. selecting jury members. And yep. the judge is already biased. Yep. So. And they got a media frenzy already. Just right. Like, we have not even started the trial. Yep. And we already assume that he's guilty. Yeah. So she chose to keep those remarks a secret until after the judge died, like a decade later. Because she, as a reporter, no, she knew that he assumed that this was off the record. He thought this was just in confidence between the two of them. I just always assume that if you don't say off the record, it's on the record. <laughs> so I would have snitched. They they make a point now when talking about this case that if she would have said anything at that point, they could have already declared a mistrial and the things may not have gone the way that they did. Huh. Hmm. So... What I'm hearing so far is that there's just no ethics in journalism. Ish. I mean, maybe her ethics were too much because she was like, well, I know he intended that to be off the record, mm -hmm. so I can't snitch. He told me that in confidence. So the, the trial started. The judge denied defense motions to move out of Cleveland, which I also think is kind of weird because usually because your jurors are from that area like there's no way for them to not have it's heard speculation super suspect to me like well, usually but also if he thinks it's an open and shut case he's not gonna give a shit if like the jury is from the area or yeah. not i think he was just sort of like succumbing to the whims of the like lock him up right now right like the cleveland press yes which is no longer around i don't think it so. is not hmm Mm. I actually used to perform in the Tower Press like building oh. <laughs> that still remains. It's like um like an art space now and we had like a a theater on the first floor. Oh. Well, I guess some good came out of that <laughs> building. There are so many accidents in front of that building and we would be like doing an improv show and someone would get pulled over every night <laughs> and the like cherries and berries would just be flashing <laughs> through the windows and we'd be like, "All right, What's an occupation that rhymes with Schmiredon? <laughs> Fireman, thank you. All right. <laughs> Nobody look out the windows. So the jury's from around his area. They have already heard, this is like October, so like since July, they've already heard the scuttlebutt about this. They've heard right. the it's newspaper the news. saying it's he's been on guilty. The newspapers. They're just talking amongst themselves, like, you know, these are your neighbors, essentially. They are supposed to be, they like they're questioned. Like, have you heard about this trial? I'm yeah. like most of the people that they were selecting were like, oh yeah, I've heard about this. All but one. All but one said that they had heard or seen things on the television about but it. But I also have to question that one. Like, where have you been? <laughs> you're like, I don't have a TV and I don't read. <laughs> where have you been, buddy? New London Township. <laughs> Have you heard of Perry? I'm from there. We we like old fashioned things. We don't like flappers or wild people. <laughs> don't make me sing. So they uh the Cleveland newspapers this is this is wild to me. The Cleveland newspapers published the jury's photos and names in the newspaper. It was like, these are the people on the jury in the Sam Shepard trial. That's wild what? to me. Yes. I I don't. I'm Listen, so I, now, I'm not in the law, but I just feel like that is uh, not a good thing to do. It's not because now you also run the risk of witness intimidation. Mm -hmm. You run the risk of those people being like, well, now everybody knows. So like, I have to vote the same way or they're going to know that I'm the one that didn't vote How that would they way. Know? Like, How would they know? As far as I know, every movie and stuff that I've seen, it's like, like it's, you just give one thing. And the only time you do like, individuals is when you're behind closed doors like when the jury's like talking and deliberating over decisions otherwise it's but guilty or not guilty but your identity you're supposed to be like Un unknown uh, right, right unknown peers so the fact that they already have your name like i would think that they'd be able to get that info i'd be like who's your who's your like plant who's your mole who's feeding you information right 
So this is a hot mess to start with. There were seven men, men, and five (laughs) women on the jury. They were taken to the shepherd home and led on a tour (laughs) of the entire house, including the bedroom where the murder took place. I, that... Also unheard of in trials. I cannot think of another trial where I'm like, yeah, that's kosher. That's right. like a part of the legality of this trial. They, yeah, they went into like the den because we didn't say this before, but the while there were no signs of like forced entry, there was some disarray in the house. Like the drawers of a desk were pulled out. Papers were thrown on the mm-hmm. floor. So things were kind of mussed up, but nothing of value was noted as missing right away so it it some of the theories were that like oh like sam just like went and like trashed the house so he could say it was a robbery he gone girled it yeah <laughs> he um changed his pen for every page in his diary <laughs> they took okay they took the jury down the stairs from behind their house to the beach where sam says that he was like wrestling with the guy the intruder but, okay but this is like in October, what do they this think? Is the sand, this is November. They think November the sand 3rd. is going to look exactly the same as they left it? Like yeah. This is November 3rd on the shores of Lake Erie. They said it was windy and overcast. And Sam was with them, handcuffed to a deputy, this entire time. And they, this makes me so sad. When they went past Sam Jr.'s room, Sam Sr. started crying I'm sure. because he Hasn't like saw his, his son and he saw his kids like teddy bear sitting on like the dresser Aww. the next day the jurors listened to the opening statements the prosecutor was john mahan and he said a reasonable interpretation of the state's evidence will point the finger of guilt at sam shepherd this defendant and Marilyn were quarreling about the activities of dr sam shepherd with other women that is the reason she was killed they argued that evidence would not show that Sam had a motive to kill on his side, (laughs) the defense. And he told the jurors that the expecting couple had just enjoyed the best four months of their marriage. This picture of him and his, like, neck brace is, like, so... (laughs) Oh, because I'm like, I know it's a real neck brace, but I I, I watch too much wrestling where I'm like, oh, is that... You see the fake one? Is that fake or is that real? (laughs) Yeah. So the first prosecution witness was Lester Adelson, who's another doctor, and he was on the stand for two days, and he proved that Marilyn Shepard died a very violent death. He showed, like, autopsy slides that were really gruesome and shocked the jurors. They audibly gasped. Why? Why? Sam asked if he could leave the courtroom I'm sure during the slideshow, and they wouldn't let him go. So he stood in a back corner of the room with his back to the screen because he didn't want to see it. When he was cross-examined, they tried to establish that Marilyn died from choking on her own blood. And they said that she died because she was beaten to death. She was alive when those blows or some of them were struck because hemorrhages found in her brain could not otherwise have developed. This is just awful. Yeah, it's heavy. One of the patrolmen who were testifying, said that he he found Sam's story implausible. He said that he didn't find any signs of a struggle inside the home. There was no forced entry. There were no reports of, like, people creeping around the neighborhood that night. Which I'm like, well, then that just means that the creeper was good. They didn't get caught. Also, he was on a beach with sand. I don't... How... I'm not a detective, but I imagine the the sand they were on was not like right at like where the you know the tide's coming in and it's break the water line's breaking and you can see. But even if it was, you wouldn't be able to see that because the water would be washing away footprints. And if right, it's windy, but like I guess they're not thinking about like the beach side of the neighborhood. They're thinking about like the street. Like yeah. nobody saw anything weird in the neighborhood. Like nobody was like, "Hey, like I saw a weird bushy-haired man creeping around in the neighborhood. He doesn't live here. I know all my neighbors." But it's it's 1954. Five, it's also 5 in the morning and I'm assuming most people were most people were asleep. Right, but they're just setting a precedence of like 
there has not been any strange person. Mm-hmm. You know, other times you're like, oh, yeah, like there was like we know everyone in Bay Village. Right. And there was like a stranger right. that we saw or we saw a strange car that didn't belong to anyone on our street. Right. Or there was a guy walking down our street who doesn't live here. Like nobody reported anything like that. OK, that's fair. But I'm just saying not everything is adding I, up. I Patrolman. Know. So the coroner then testifies he was the prosecution's they were really like you're gonna help us here we're gonna get him he testified that a blood stain on Marilyn's pillow appeared to have been caused by the murder weapon and he said in this blood stain i could make out the impression of a surgical instrument that that's all he said it was it was just a surgical yes. instrument so Sam's Sam's attorney immediately was just like, strike that from the record. Absolutely not. And the judge denied the motion, said, nope, it stays in. Okay, but here's, you're a coroner. That means you are an ME. You are a medical exam. You have a medical degree. Shouldn't you know what instrument, if you can tell an outline? Like, I just feel like you should know what instrument it is if you're that good of a coroner. Yeah. So he he showed two color slides of the pillow stain he was talking about. He used like a pointer, one of those long extending metal pointers, <laughs> to point out the outline of a claw-like object. He then gave the pillowcase to the jur- jurors who passed it around. And they uh, this person writing the summary described it as a Rorschach test held it up and they were like trying to figure out like well i guess it kind of looks like this but if you look over here it looks like it might have been this yeah Uh, i'm gonna have a conniption over here because you you're having strangers touch evidence and getting all their little fingerprints on dna wasn't a thing back then i know i know know. it just um, i my little 90s science brain Uh is not having it yeah the defense suggested that the imprint was just because of an overlay on the pillow, like when the blood was still wet and like the pillowcase like got crumpled up, and they're like, "That's why it looks like that." <laughs> you and know, the like cor- a logical yeah. answer. And the coroner was like, "Absolutely not! Like that Im- that blood imprint is revealing like absolutely the shape of the murder weapon." And then he showed God. another slide later in the day that showed Sam's blood spat- uh, blood splattered watch. And he said that blood must have come from Marilyn as she was brutally murdered by her husband. Did they not test that blood? I don't know. So then Detective Schottke gets on the stand and he starts pointing out some inconsistencies in Sam's story. He told the jurors that in one telling, Sam said he was hit by the form going upstairs. So he's hit by the the intruder going upstairs. And another version, he said he was hit in the hallway. In another, he said he was in the bedroom next to the bed itself when he was hit. He also sort of set up the home run pitch for Susan to knock it out by testifying that in his interrogation of Shepard, Sam had insisted that he and Susan were nothing more than good friends. I just, I always want to say they were roommates. And they were roommates. But they were not roommates. They were workmates. Yeah. (laughs) They were co-workers, <laughs> sexy time co-workers. So they had a fingerprint expert that came in and said he only found one fingerprint in the entire bedroom. Um, it was on the headboard of Marilyn's bed that was identical with the left thumb of Sam. Huh. <laughs> so wild that they found one fingerprint. On the bed that he sleeps in. Every day. <laughs> and, you know, like... Touches multiple times a day, which his lawyer was like, uh, and I quote, did you ever hear of a man coming into a bedroom and kissing his wife at night? <laughs> like, he could have easily grabbed the headboard and leaned down over her to kiss her. I mean, they, so this is, I should, I should point out also, this is the 50s. So they did not sleep in the same bed. They had two single beds in the same room, Lucy and Ricky style. Like, I love Lucy. That was the norm Lucy back then. Ricky style. You maybe slept in the same room, but you had your own bed. So this was on Marilyn's bed where she was found. So I you know what that actually makes a lot of sense now. I wasn't like because I I saw one of the pictures and I went, Oh, 
but I thought that is a very small bed. Yeah, they were like twin beds. Yes, that. And then you pushed them together to do the, <laughs> the bop, 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 and then you pushed them apart again. So, the chief medical technologist in the coroner's office testified that Marilyn had type O blood, and that the blood on Sam's pants appeared to be type O, but that wasn't entirely conclusive. Later, when we go deeper into the forensic things, I will bring that up again. So that started in November, and now we're in December. Susan Hayes takes the stand. Oh, no. She had previously been referred to in the trial only as Miss X. Stop it. Stop it. And remember that she's, like, a very pretty young woman, too. So this is also, like, inadvertently swaying the jury just because of the way she looks. And there's, like, a picture of her, like, leaving the courtroom with her hanky, like... Very like, oh, don't make me testify. <laughs> so that she answered Aww. questions in a flat voice. Um, she described the intimate relationship she had with Dr. Sam. And the prosecutor's last question for her hinted at possible motive for Marilyn's murder. He asked, in all this period you've told us about in which your activities with Sam were going on, you were aware, were you not, that he was a married man? which she answered yes and then he stood and said your honor the state rests i yeah i guess it's the 50s so you know i even though i know cheating happened like a lot like throughout history that's not like a new thing like i i'm guessing like while cheating could be used as a motive like i'm just thinking if this murder were to happen today i don't think they would be as heavily pressing on miss hayes the way they were in the 50s which says to me like wow men sexism love that for us (laughs) because it's just as much like a a detriment to her and that's also part of the reason why they were like just deny it just deny it yeah like don't ruin her reputation yeah they also really thought that they could just be like what is this like this literally has nothing to do with the murder like we're gonna get it tossed out like don't even answer those questions like it'll make it a cleaner sweep for us to get it out of here but that's not how it worked and this judge sucks so (laughs) the defense moved for a directed verdict of acquittal but you know the judge was like sucks to be you absolutely not denying that motion and while the prosecution essentially had this like support of a judge of like this is an open and shut case the husband did mm-hmm. it the husband always did it our job's really easy here look at this he's cheating we're fine sam's lawyers were essentially they thought their best method was to show the jury that his injuries he sustained had to have come from an intruder right while there that is like sense. a you know possibility that they could have come from like Marilyn trying to fight him off it would have been like really hard for that to have been the case so that was that was the route that they were going to take in there presenting the case he just really hoped that the jury would like support this <laughs> about like him grappling with the bushy haired man Stephen, Sam's brother said that when he first saw Sam on July 4th in the morning, he said, I thought he was dead. He said he, like, touched his neck and there were, like, involuntary muscle spasms happening. Sam kept blacking out and had to be, quote-unquote, practically dragged out of his house to the hospital. There were four attending doctors and three nurses who confirmed Sam's injuries at the Bayview Hospital. Um, One of these nurses testified that Sam's feet were all shriveled up as if they had been in the water a long time. One of the doctors, a radiologist. (laughs) I don't know why it took my brain like a minute. Because he was passed out on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, why is his feet all shriveled? Yeah. Um, One of the radiologists testified that an x-ray of Sam showed a probable fracture in his second cervical vertebrae. So in his, in his neck. Um, Another doctor said he found swelling at the base of Sam's skull. Another doctor testified that the neck spasms um, couldn't be faked. That's just a real injury that he had. There's, like, no way for him to be, like... I just want to... Well, I mean, they don't... They have... I know I've read that they have, like... But I won't talk about the murder weapon. I just want to know, like, how hard were you hit that, like, you got your neck 
broken and like you know you had sp- spasms like yeah and where I mean, where on the neck were you hit exactly that caught and, and was maybe it i'm times, maybe but... i'm wrong but those kind of injuries are not usually from like the impact itself it's from the recoil from an impact so it's like you getting hit and then your head hitting something oh. slamming down as you fall or um like the force propelling you forward rather than like actually that thing hitting you ah. so again really hard to fake like you can't hit yourself that hard no, from no, behind your not, body you, no because you can't your your body is yes. smarter than your yes. brain can be so um it's very interesting though to think about <laughs> yeah so um the the rest of this defense strategy basically came down to putting sam on the stand and just hoping that the jury believed him <laughs> oh, no. so again he as we've said tended to come off very arrogant and they and this is an excellent word that they used but they called him glib like which i just always think of that interview with tom cruise when he was like losing his mind it was like you're being very glib (laughs) (laughs) um so this was this was like okay like we really need them to like you so maybe don't come off as a super smart asshole (laughs) Um, Could you imagine being we the want defense them to like lawyer you. and yeah. like trying to be like, okay, you're a doctor, but kind of dumb down your answers a little bit, but also emote, but not too, but just, but emote. We need you to emote, okay? Yeah. So he took the stand on December 9th to start three days of his testimony. They said he was wearing a blue suit a white shirt, a knitted tie, and he took the stand and described his relationship with Marilyn. He said they were pretty happy. Um, He said the topic of divorce never came up. He said, you know, as Beth said, sure, like, you know, we're married. We had some disagreements. He, like, brought up Marilyn buying an electric dishwasher with money that he wanted to use on insurance payments, but, like, that was that was like the worst argument <laughs> that they had. Um, he said Marilyn was, and I quote, in my corner. So he felt supported by her. His descriptions of the events of the murder were still pretty close to what he'd been saying before. Um, they say that the way he explained <laughs> himself, though, was awkward he would never say like, "Oh, I saw a man." He would say, "I visualized a man," or <laughs> just, he wouldn't say like the man he saw a form. I visualized a white form rather than I saw a guy standing could you there. Imagine though, his lawyer as he's like saying these words, you're just yes. like, "No, that's Sam. We yes. had this conversation. I literally told you use just normal nomenclature." I just here's the thing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a clinician, but this just slaps of, like, neurospicy. Like, oh. it was the 1950s, <laughs> so, like, they didn't think about things like that no, back then. No, he just would have been a... But I absolutely would not be surprised if he is, like, neurodivergent. I'm not saying he's, like, on the spectrum, but if he's, like, if that is why, that would explain a lot of these, like, tendencies that he has of, like... I use this advanced vernacular. I don't understand why you have a problem with it. It's not my fault if you're not smart enough to understand me. <laughs> like, God. that's not me being a jerk. That's just me stating a fact. Like, I could very much see that. He he said when he heard her screaming, when he heard Marilyn screaming, he was stimulated to go to her. So it's, you know, that was not helping his case Buddy, that he's using But you couldn't have used compelled or... I rushed to go to her or right. um, I was afraid, worried. I don't, any of these words that I'm using, I'm like a thesaurus right now. I love, and I just, okay, he said later he had a vague sensation of being in the water after wrestling with the form who had evidence of a good sized head. Oh, buddy. And all of a sudden I wake up in the water with this guy with a big old noggin just wailing away <laughs> on me. I don't know 
why our go-to for when we're talking about people, hey like, i got a lot of big feelings here yeah, why are, yeah they're like they're like brooklyn light <laughs> ambiguous east coast <laughs> hey, oh, hey look at that on this guy oh my god oh what are you wearing a brillo pad get out of here <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh suffice to say this did not really endear him to the jury which is what they were hoping would happen so he didn't help himself out much um during the cross-examination they really honed in on his like relationships with other women they got him to admit that while he was married to Marilyn, he met a patient in a car by a park and kissed her and they were like was that part of your treatment doctor which yeah that's pretty gross um he finally admitted that he did have an affair with susan hayes over a two-year period he said that his brother helped him understand the need to terminate the relationship with hayes he said steve explained to me that the sex relation was painful to Marilyn, which again <laughs> That right there yeah. feels very, like, yeah. neurospicy to me. Like, I didn't realize that. Someone else had to explain to me that somebody else had feelings about this. <laughs> oh, boy. Can you imagine being on the jury, though, at that point? And then, like, that's how it's described. Especially if you're one of the the, the women jurors yeah. that, like, are in a relationship. Like, I would have been like... Here's the thing, though. Hmm. I would also say... Sam was a really good-looking guy. He was a really good-looking guy. And he was guy. young, and he was smart, and he was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And while he is in the sensationalized trial for allegedly murdering his wife, there are people who write letters to serial killers in prison. That's true. So there is That's also a good true. chance that one of those women might have just been like, wow, dreamy, I believe you. <laughs> what was that? Yes. Sam, you're tied. It's yes, so I'm knitted. picturing the girl from the beginning of Indiana Jones that has the like I love you written on her eyelids so when oh. she blinks, he sees it. <laughs> <laughs> and Indy's like, uh, class dismissed, get out. <laughs> Yikes, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Sam can't leave the stand, so he's just like staring at this. Sam's like, I'm sorry, I can't turn my neck. It's broken. What's on your face? <laughs> Ma'am, are you aware that you have a residue? plastered across your eyelids are you perhaps uh lacking in sleep <laughs> oh it appears that someone has written upon your skin i don't know i can't think of any other medical terminology about eyeballs <laughs> god uh oh. so he continued to deny that he ever said anything or even contemplated divorcing marilyn and before they let him go back to his seat, the prosecution asked him directly about Marilyn's murder and said, isn't it a fact that you beat your wife to death? To which Sam answered, no, sir. And he said, and after you killed her, didn't you run out of the house toward the beach and injure yourself by falling down the beach steps or jumping off the platform at the beach house? To which Sam replied, that's absolutely untrue, sir, and I think it's very unfair. Oh. Yeah. But... You feel bad because up until this point, it's like he has not endured himself. No, to... and I am full, like full transparency. Like I kept thinking about reading this, and I was like, if it, if me with my mentality today was there in that situation, or if this was presented in a similar way today, I also probably be like, he for sure did it. Look at this smug asshole. Mm -hmm. Men, am I right? Like. <laughs> I for sure would have been like, oh, he's guilty. Lock him up. What a piece of shit. Because I didn't have the full story. Yep. <laughs> so yep. I, I, I do feel really bad for him with all of this. But they started their closing arguments on December 15th. They basically, the prosecution just tore into his story. He was like... Could this man in the prime of his life have been rendered senseless with a single blow? Like, this is a young dude. How'd you get knocked out twice so bad by a guy clocking you once? Like, why Why was there no other... Like, why was nothing knocked over in the room if you were fighting someone? Why wasn't there a sign that you had been fighting with another man in there? 
Um, how could he have hit Marilyn 35 times in the time between when you heard her scream and when you got upstairs to her room? I mean, that is a good question. <laughs> Why can you not remember where the F your T-shirt went? <laughs> and unfortunately, this list of questions visibly you could see on the jury that he was swaying them to his side. Mm -hmm. So he, I'm sorry. All I can hear I know. Is I hear the tater tot, tot running. Like, <laughs> I just keep waiting to hear the like, boom, 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 ma, ma, at the top of the stairs. The defense attorney concluded by telling the jurors you have the opportunity to turn back the tide to tell the people of the nation of the world that the constitutional right to a fair trial still lives. Ooh. Right. The judge sent the jury to deliberations on Friday, December 17th. They didn't come back until the following Tuesday. Dude, it, wait, I, cause I don't know. I, I assume it's a Monday through Friday gig. So did they only deliberate on Friday, Monday, Tuesday? I don't know because like you are sequestered usually in mm -hmm. trials like this. So I am wondering if maybe they did Saturday, Sunday, Monday, come back Tuesday, but I don't know. Interesting. I don't know. Interesting. Um it took them 18 ballots, but the jury finally returned a verdict. Judge Blythin read the verdict. We find the defendant not guilty of murder in the first degree, but guilty of murder in the second degree, and then sentenced Shepard to life with his first eligibility for parole in 10 years, which might be a good place. I think that's a good to place stop to stop this stop. one. Yeah, because we're... <laughs> and then we will come back uh, in 1966. <laughs> we will move forward 10 years into the future, one week apart. So... Yeah, um, join us next time to find out kind of what happens after this first uh If you think this verdict. is a shit show, my God, buckle up and yeah. maybe bring a beer next week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. So yeah, join us next week to find out about the rest of uh, this trial as well as uh, Sam Shepard, the rest of his life. And... Um, we hope that you guys are kind to one another, and uh, this will be airing like the week of Valentine's Day, I think. So, happy Valentine's Day. Um, You know, be kind to one another. Buy yourself some chocolates the day after Valentine's Day when they're 50% off. Don't do they even do that anymore? I don't. Some I places do. I feel like do, I never see I discounted Target, candy. Well, here's the thing. I'm always working the day after Valentine's, yeah. so by the time I get to the store, it's just like, like if I go to Target, nothing, nothing is there. I'm like, yeah. good God, I, I walk around even though I'm part of the problem, and I'm like, savages, what savages have done this? Right. Why, why are there underwear in the chocolates? Why are there <laughs> cards just strewn about everywhere? My favorite thing though is like a choice was made: underwear, candy. Fuck it, I'll go commando. <laughs> Give me the candy, like. <laughs> A clear choice was made in that moment. Yes, but it's always, like, I always get there, and I'm like, wow, there's, like, slim pickings of just nothing. And yeah. I think Target got smart, because they used to be 50% off, and then, like, now they're, like, 25. And I'm like, 25? 25? 25? You keep your 25% Target. That ain't shit. That ain't shit. A whole You're $2? Get the fuck out of here. Your lint chocolate's like $35. You don't need it. You sell Stanley mugs. <laughs> you got that Stanley mug money. You got that Magnolia farm and table money. You don't need this money, Target. No. Mark down your candy. That's right. Anyways, off of our <laughs> capitalist platform. I can't even eat half of it, but you fucking mark that down. <laughs> So, yeah, we hope you guys have a good holiday. Uh, keep your loved ones close. Do something nice for that yourself. That sounded like a threat. Keep your loved ones <laughs> keep close. Keep your loved ones close or else Beth's going to come <laughs> fucking steal them. I'm not. She's I... been inspired by the philandering in this case. <laughs> I can't, listen, I got enough. I got enough with my house of uh, tater tot, husband, dog, enough. 
That's good. I got nothing. I'm alone. <laughs> I'm going to die alone. Again, this episode has been brought to you by BetterHelp. Please sponsor us so I can go to therapy. <laughs> All right, guys. Once again, thank you to our spooky sponsor. Thank you, spooky sponsor. And uh, yeah, have a happy Valentine's Day and stay spooky, friends. <laughs> <laughs>